Thanks for coming out on such a cool evening here. Um, tonight we're going to do uh, Mayan and Nahuatl, which is sort of a second half of Spanish, because the real expansion of Spanish as a language actually occurred primarily in the New World, and it occurred, uh, uh, and it, the expansion of Spanish occurred by <coughs> displacing um, many, many, many of the native languages that were spoken in the New World. Uh, but to get a handle on this, and we want to go back to sort of the origins of Mesoamerica and work our way out. But something to think about, and this is what I mentioned last time, uh, that you had the language, the sort of Indo-European language family, and that they discovered through contact and spread of civilization and philological and linguistic study that there must have been some common root language to many of the languages all over Europe and India, and through a broad sweep, unexpectedly, <coughs> thousands of miles uh, of territory. What this tells us is there was, in the you know, very ancient world, four, five, six, seven thousand years ago, a shared common linguistic ancestry to many of the languages in that region. What's fascinating about Mesoamerica is the division, the settlement of Mesoamerica was basically took place long enough ago and with the, the, with the disappearance of the land bridge into the North, North America, then isolated it. And so you have this interesting petri dish uh, sort of experiment where we have a truly isolated culture or cultures, many cultures, but separated from the sort of Indo-European line. So you have your sort of Indo-European line, you have your Chinese line, another very separated, but, but you know, trade with China kicked up pretty early. Mesoamerica was isolated from, depending on when you think it was originally settled, I mean, that, that's still a big scholarly debate. So, you know, you can't say, well, it was this day that this happened. It looked like it was probably happening in waves, not didn't happen at one time. But let's just say roughly 16,000 years ago, or 16,000 BC, so 18,000 years ago. Um, that means that after that, there was basically no contact with any development. And so we get parallel civilizations developing, which is great because you can't run scientific experiments on the universe. They always want to do this, right? If we could photocopy the universe and do something over here and not do it over here, then we could see the outcomes. It'd be great. <laughs> In this case, history sort of helped us do precisely that. We got to launch we didn't get to, what happened was the launch of isolated, vast collection of linguistic, archaeological, architectural uh, civilizations in isolation that were then discovered uh, late enough to become historical, which is also a key. Many, many, many civilizations throughout history were destroyed before they, had, before they developed writing or sufficiently uh, sophisticated societies to have architectural ruins or pottery ruins or metal that would help us understand what was there. So this was just a, a great uh, event in human history, transformed the intellectual thinking of, of Europe and the New World, sort of blew the mind of Mesoamerica, of course, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is one thing to keep in mind as, as we talk about this, is what a unique and fascinating event this was. It can, and of course, this could only happen once. Once the contact is made, well, you sort of ruined the experiment, and, and now it's, it, it's, it's, you know, history keeps rolling on. Um, but one way to understand this is, is you no. Know, imagine you're from Mars, right? We've all, we are all Martians, and we don't speak any of earthly languages. We don't recognize them. In fact, they're so alien to us, we can't translate them. And we come down, and all the population of the world has been destroyed. But you, you, you land, and you start, you send your archaeologists down, they start doing studies say, in, 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 the, in the Americas. And one thing they would notice right away is that there's this one kind of writing that occurs roughly from Alaska down to, you know, L.A. And then at that point, there develops this mix of another kind of writing. Very similar, has an alphabet, but it, it, clearly it's different. <coughs> And that that second language becomes dominant as you go further south. So immediately, without being able to read a word, you, the, as an aliens, you would recognize, oh, this is you would start making suppositions. Oh, these are probably 
uh, contiguous cultural entities that have a shared linguistic past. Now, we, they wouldn't know what the political relationships were. They wouldn't know any of that. But they could see that, well, this must be shared. And at some point, there's a mixing. There isn't a hard line, which suggests a lot of interchange. And you would see it in the vocabulary. Again, they would recognize words that are being borrowed by both languages. And they'd say, well, then this other culture becomes dominant. And then looking at the alphabets, they would say, clearly, they have a shared past someplace, because there's no way that this alphabet was developed independently in two different places. And then as they studied, they would discover, you know, one of those languages, English, on like Australia, which would blow their minds, right? Because they'd be, well, how the hell did they get the same language over there? That makes no sense. And then they'd discover it in England and go, wow. You know, North America, England, Australia, what the hell is up with this language? And then right across the water there, they would find Spanish, that other language. And they would be like, wait a second. And they would start drawing maps, trying to work out all of these spreads. But much, even if you, without reading a word, it, they would say one of these countries, one of these areas originated the language and it spread out, weirdly spread out. Why did it didn't go... 10 miles across the, the water to that big continent there, instead of several thousand miles over there, we don't know, right? That would be, that would stump them. Like people would give speeches at conferences and they'd say, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, then, you know, people would argue. But that sort of capacity, even without reading a language, is an astounding insight into the history and development of cultures. And this is what's important to know. Many of the Mesoamerican languages have not been translated in part or at all. Um, either they left too few records or they're just too hard, which we'll talk about, if that, hence many of the pictures that I've given you here. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't reconstruct very um, good maps of this sort of influence and shared culture and, uh, over time, because we can. But it's, but it's not necessary, that's important to read. You don't need to read the languages to be able to understand a lot of this. Being able to read them, of course, is a huge advantage, which we've also been able to do with Mayan and Nahuatl, which is why specifically I want to work on those. So keeping that in mind, we have the, the Mesoamerican sort of timeline. Again, 16,000 years, or 16,000 BC, roughly, um, you get major immigration. It doesn't take them too long, actually, to reach all the way down to the tip of South America. Um, our ancient ancestors were nothing if not wanderers. They really got about quickly, surprisingly quickly. There's some evidence that there was an original settlement that's, that failed. All of them died out, followed by a second wave of migration. Um, but again, much of this is, is very controversial. About um, 1800 BC, uh, so, you know, roughly 4,000 years ago, you start getting the earliest of what were sort of identifiably, quote unquote, Mayan ruins. Now, again, this is very loose because there was no single Mayan language, there was no single Mayan people, but it seemed to be a shared cultural iconography uh, approach to agriculture, these kinds of things, pottery shards, uh, uh, stone carvings. <clears throat> So we started seeing the first of this about 1800 BC. This is in Central America, by the way, uh, the Mayan Central America, Guatemala, uh, Southern Mexico, these, these, these kinds of areas. Um, about 500 to 300 BCE, depending on how you score, earliest surviving writing. Now this is huge, because this is pretty early. I mean, it's much late, later uh, than, than in Mesopotamia, um, which had developed writing at least you know, 3,000 years before then. But What's curious is, here's an isolated culture, 16,000 years, probably the earliest date, no contact, they develop writing. So we know this is probably the third or fourth, there's a big argument uh, about how many times writing has been independently developed. China is almost certainly one, Mesopotamia is certainly one, Egyptian hieroglyphics, a lot of controversy where they sort of stole it from uh, uh, the Mesopotamian danced it up, made it nice, uh, or, or, but certainly the Mesoamerican writing is one. There's no doubt about that. See, there's no, what's curious is there doesn't seem to be any necessity. Why writing? But at least three times, probably four, writing has been developed completely independently by isolated peoples. It suggests something 
very important about human civilization and cultural <coughs> development. That given enough time, given enough people, given a little density, we start writing things down. Also interestingly, the writing shares many, many forms of the writing that was developed other verb tenses, word order. Uh, it seems to be necessary. It seems that when you develop a language, it seems basically this is what you do. As soon as you start writing it down, you start doing you know, verb tenses and word orders of particular kinds. Uh, it shares actually, uh, Mayan later develops, shares a lot of uh, elements with Akkadian, which is a very old language. Um, okay, so then you get about 200, well, let's see, where were we? So we get the earliest writing, uh, Mayan is about 300 BCE, certainly 500 maybe. Um, and then you get the slow development and accretion of Mayan civilization. They break it into, you know, old pre-classical, pre-classical, early, you know, so you have all these divisions. But basically, this is when it really gets going as an identifiable uh, political, civic entity. By 200 AD, so this is a long run, you are in full-blown imperial Mayan mode. Lots of big cities. I mean, lots of really big cities. They did monumental work in stone, and they used huge stones. Um, it seemed like, it, this, a lot of the ancient civilizations did this. <coughs> they, they didn't build with mud bricks. They could have. They had the resources. <coughs> but they built in stone. Um, and so you've see, probably seen the plazas and the pyramids, um, very highly organized uh, social structures necessary to build these resource intensive communities. Now some debate in this early date whether they were actually <coughs> lived cities or whether they were periodical gathering places for religious ceremonies. By a later date, it's clear that they had full, they were, they were actually full urban environments with people living there permanently, big trading centers. Uh, earlier, they may not have been, but that's certainly what they developed into. There are so many Mayan ruins that no, we haven't even, they're not even cataloged. They just, a couple years ago, they just found another huge city. I mean, this, I mean, not small, I mean, big, big, big. And so, and they're just, and they know there's more out there. They do these uh, satellite sweeps that they're getting much better at, and they keep finding them, and they just label them. And they're like, well, we haven't sent anybody there to look at that. There's thousands of them. Um, and many of the ones that have been around for a long time are still not fully excavated. So mine history is not anywhere close to being written. I mean, the work is going on today, and there's lots to do. So if anybody wants to go into archaeology, it's <laughs> certainly a great field to go into because there's an endless amount of work that needs to be done. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so... For the classical Mayan period, another de important development is they develop a true class of literate people. And this is rare in the world. And many civilizations existed that never developed writing, or they didn't use it very much, or they used it in very limited ways. The Mayans developed a fully literate society. They had paper of a kind. They wrote on lots of bark. Um, they carved on everything. They had the, the glyph system that we'll talk about in, in, in a moment. Uh, and, they, and they just, wherever they went, they wrote a lot. And so we know that there was an entire class of literate people. And they were writing histories and poetry. There's some evidence that they had a form of fiction. Uh, none of that has survived, but, but it, they may have had a form of fiction. Um, and they grew increasingly powerful, increasingly wealthy, until 900-ish AD when the whole thing fell apart. No one knows why. So this is, this is you know, several centuries before the Spanish show up, so we can't blame them for that. We blame them for a lot, not for the decline of the mind. Um, there's all kinds of arguments. This is, you know, was it an early plague problem? Was it a change in, in environment? There's some evidence that they entered a dry spell and that they couldn't keep their irrigation going. Did they over uh, tap their resources? Did they just piss off enough of their neighbors that they finally got stomped out? Right? No, one, no one knows precisely what happened. Um, from 900, you get not a, a rapid decline, not a slow decline. You get a rapid decline of that civilization. By the time the Spanish show up, 1500 roughly, um, there are a few literate Mayans left, but not many. Um, there are a remnant of the scribal literate culture that had existed for, you know, 600 years, but that is all. A few Mayan texts, besides the carvings, 
have survived, four basically, um, some in copies, some originals. Um, and you have pictures on uh, those pictures, do the one. Yeah, the, the, the Dresden Codex on the back there is an example of, of one. Uh, didn't photocopy that well, but it actually doesn't look that, that, that well. Now, the um, Spanish did burn some collections of Mayan writings, which is a horrible tragedy because it would have been great to have them. But most of the writings were destroyed much earlier in the conflicts as the Mayan decline and simply because things rot in the tropics very quickly. One reason we have so many Egyptian writings have survived is because Egypt is the perfect place to store writings. Right? If, 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 it, if Egypt had a different climate, we would not have any of, of Egypt's, of the scrolls, anything from Egypt. South America, Central America, not so kind to written material. Um, but some are being still discovered. Some scraps, some, actually some, I think, it's not the Dresden Codex. One of the codexes was discovered not too long ago in Europe. One of the, one of the, one of the priests had taken it back with him and, you know, put it, in his box, and the box went to the library someplace, and somebody opened it 300 years later and went, oh, look, Mayan writing, how great. You know, so, so there's, these writings are still being discovered. The vast, vast majority of Mayan writing is the carvings. Um, there's been over 40 or 50,000 documented individuals, some quite large carvings, and there's thousands and thousands more. So it is this massive, a repository of history, uh, battles, dates, and uh, marriages, lines of kingship. Um, and by stringing that all together, we're able to create this history of a truly spectacular civilization, the Mayan civilization. Um, we should take a moment and say, now, now if you look at the chart on the front that shows the, the Mayan glyphs, <clears throat> it took about 250 years of really hard work to break the Mayan writing system, despite the fact that they had thousands, tens of thousands of examples. Usually that's plenty. If you give a modern uh, scholar 10,000 examples of somebody's writing, generally speaking, they're going to crack it, no problem. Mayan, extraordinarily difficult. A couple of reasons. First, the supposition was there's nothing here but a calendar. So they quickly worked out the Mayan calendar because it's a counting system. And so, hey, we, we got that. And so they said, oh, these are just calendars with no other information on them. And this argument held sway right up until about late 60s, early 70s. And it was primarily one woman. There was a Russian researcher who everybody ignored because it was the Cold War and we knew the Russians were ignorant up to no good. <laughs> he said, it looks like there's phonetic information here. And he started working on this. But there was another woman who, being a woman, was also easier to ignore in the 70s. But she really started providing evidence that, no, no, there are phonemes. There are sounds, not just pictures. There are names here, not just calendars. And notice if you get a calendar and dates, well, that's the information. Well, they built this monument in the fourth cycle of the third moon of whatever. OK, we can date this and say, well, this is, you know, 780 this was built. If you then decipher a name of a king, ah, now you know that this monument was built probably by this king on this date. And if the next monument over has a later date and the king's name plus the sign for sun, we go, ah, oh, we know that the son of that king built this monument right next door 20 years later, right? And so you start building these successions, you get this whole map of the work that's going on, the archaeology, the construction that they were doing, the architecture, and how it evolved, the order that evolved, the pressure that was under, who was invading, who was taking over, the lines of family. So it's a huge breakthrough. And then whole groups of scholars. There's, there's, some of this is, is oversimplified, but in this case, it was truly a, groups of scholars began working out that, no, this is actually a full phonetic alphabet, not really, the syllabary. Now, what this means is that any word sound you can make in the language, there's a symbol for that sound. This is how syllabaries work. But usually, syllabaries have not a lot of pictures, not a lot of symbols. So each, each one of these is a symbol, right? And you go, well, how many of them could there be? 30, maybe 40 at the outside? Well, there were hundreds. Somebody else, well, they're logograms, right? They're just each 
picture means one thing. So this picture means it's a snake. And I go, okay, but there's not nearly enough. If you're going to do that kind of system, which is like Chinese, lots of symbols, you need a lot of symbols to make anything meaningful. So don't ask me how they worked this out. But over time they went, hey, maybe it's both. And this turns out to be the key to really breaking this. These are both uh, phonemes, they both, they're both a syllabary and symbols. The only language that really works like this now is Japanese. It's one of the reasons the Japanese is one of the hardest languages to learn is because they use everything. Not only that, but they change the symbols sort of at will. So if you have a glyph that represents snake, the, the individual scribe was free to write it any number of ways. So there wasn't one, there was like 10 or 15 different snake symbols, which the, they could just use for variation. They got bored, right? So that's what they worked out. They really think it was just to give the scribes the opportunity to vary the carvings and their skills and show their talents. Um, and so you get, sometimes it's a sound, sometimes it's a symbol, sometimes it's a weird symbol, but actually it's very different, but is in fact the same symbol. And that has allowed us to construct a complete historical record of the Mayan civilization. I mean, more coming, if you're interested in the subject, is incredibly interesting, but we tend not to think, you think of the world's great civilizations, we don't, you know, Mayan doesn't pop into our head, but it should. I mean, they had a, well, they had a, a, a 700-ish year run as really powerful, centralized empire, and before that, they had several hundred years of development. I mean, this puts them on the same timeline as Rome. They never got quite as big as the Roman Empire. The geographical limitations are a little more severe in, in the Americas. Um, but they, they were coherent, writing, architecturally inventive, agriculturally intensive civilization for, you know, a thousand years, for a millennium. And we have a, a shockingly good historical record of that thanks to the archaeological work uh, and the decoding that's gone on. So it's just a, a, a amazing. So if you look at the glyphs that I have here, if you look at just the top one where it says, uh, let's see. Um, I, by the way, I know I butcher every language that we do. I'm going to particularly butcher tonight's languages. I apologize. But these things, it's just, I, I actually think that the ancient Americans were simply going, oh, this will be impossible for them to pronounce in 400 years. Let's spell it like this. Uh, um, but like this one says, um, Kumka would be my, my close approximate, approximation there. So uh, that seems to be the sound, right? That would be the ph phonetic sound for that. Um, was manifested the image. So that's the translation. Kumka halkobs was manifested the image, right? Uh, where you say uh, the stone jaguar patler where it says tune there a few symbols down, that main image there, the sort of face you can see, if you go down one, two, three, that is the jaguar. That's the jaguar face. Very popular image. You'll see the jaguar face all over the place, but in many different forms. How they recognize this or work it out, I have no idea. Um, and so this, again, this is, this is an example of what they had to work with. And so it reads something like that. Aha was, was manifested the image Three stones were set, they planted the stone, jaguar, paddler, stingray, paddler. It happened at the first five sky, jaguar, thrown stone. He planted the stone, uh, and then they don't know, black fist, red, question, question. It happened at the earth place, serpent thrown stone, and then it happened, the stone was set. Uh, not Itzami, a name. Water, uh, water lily thrown stone. It happened at lying down sky, uh, which is a calendar date, lying down sky. First three stone place were completed 13 baktuns, another calendar, another calendar reference. It was his action raised up sky lord. So that is an example of sort of how you read a collection of, of these unreadable glyphs, I would say, but... but I guess we have to believe them when they tell us this. Um, those are carvings, and those are in stone. Again, most of what we have. If you look on the back, the Dresden Codex, that's what it looks like when it's written. That was written on paper. So, um, it's 
people, uh, very, actually they had several different kinds of papers, several different kinds of bars. They had something very approximate of true paper though. They, they um, traded with a particular tribe that could make it. That was their big trade. They forced them to give it to them, I guess. Well, you, uh, uh, they extorted it from this neighboring tribe. That was one of the main things that they were required to supply. Tribute, that's what we call that, a tribute. Not an extortion, uh, a tribute. Um, so this, this huge, rich repository exists. Again, by the time the Spanish arrive, this is very much in decline, but the Mayan language, not written but spoken, is still covered a broad area. And this is hugely important to the Spanish. Because if you want to conquer or control an area, you need to be able to communicate with people. There's not very many Spanish, and the natives, by the way, there's many texts referring to the fact that all of the natives were convinced they would never learn Spanish. They're like, what crazy language do you speak? We're never going to learn this. And, and the Spanish recognized immediately, as I mentioned last time, that you want to learn their language and communicate with them. And one thing that allowed the, the Spanish Empire to spread successfully is that there was a pre-existing cultural coherence, linguistic coherence. There's lots of versions of Maya, lots of other languages, but Maya and its versions are sort of a lingua franca over this very wide air territory from the Atlantic or the Caribbean to the Pacific. So it went all the way across Central America, and again from southern Mexico, you know, down past Guatemala. And so once they were able to communicate in Mayan, ah, they had the key. And then the, the existing Mayan speakers could talk to the other people. All the translators already existed for those languages and allowed them to uh, coordinate and organize a social hierarchy very quickly because the pre-existing empire was there, all the social structures. So, if, so if, our, if our virtual Martians had come down, it's much easier for them to learn English. As soon as they learn English, well, they can communicate with everybody from northern Alaska down to southern California, off to the east coast, and England, Australia, and New Zealand. That's very much easier than if we all spoke a thousand different languages. This is going to slow their program up immensely. Other settlers were not this when, when the Portuguese land in, in modern-day Brazil, they did not have this advantage. It was much more difficult for them to get organized because there was no vast empire there that they could build on top of. So the Spanish empire really becomes the, a, a, a late-coming overlay on top of a pre-existing social coherence that allowed them to, on one hand, spread successfully, but really also continued and helped organize the Mayan, you know, the continuity of Mayan civilization continued. Um, many texts were written. That's of people familiar with the Popol Vuh. The, the, um, that is a text that was written from an oral tradition in Spanish very soon after uh, the Spanish arrived because they went, oh, we can use Spanish to record our heritage. And so many, or a, a subset of existing scribes started doing this. And so that's how many of these traditions were brought into the modern world. They weren't written in the Mayan, but the same stories were written in Spanish. And so some of that has, has survived and come down to us much more effectively. There are still millions and millions of speakers of the Mayan languages alive today. It's a very widespread, very popularly spoken language. There is some writing in it. In fact, there's even some writing in Mayan. Since when, when the Mayan glyphs were finally decoded in, in the sort of say early to late 80s, one of the things they went to is the people who said they still spoke Mayan and they tried it out on them. They said, we're going to read you something. Tell, me, tell us, does this sound familiar to you? And they would read it and they would say, oh yeah, that's the language we speak. And so there's now this literacy going back into Mayan. People are studying and learning Mayan because it's already the language they speak. So it is not this big leap for them. They're just learning how to write it in this ridiculous glyph system. I mean, it's really a crazy system. But so now, dual language literary texts are being written in generally Spanish and Mayan, which is, which is incredible. This is, a, this is a, a, a rebirth of that literacy. But again, it's important to remember this is a rebirth of the written part of it because millions of people still speak it. And there is, again, I should mention, there is not one Mayan language. There is a lot of related Mayan languages. 
um, like more like Spanish, Italian, and French. Probably a little closer than that, but but not that you know they're not all mutually 100% intelligible. So that's that's one half of this uh, that I want to talk about. The other one is Nahuatl, um, and this is the language of the Aztec Empire. Now. It was not the language apparently the Aztecs originally spoke, but it, it seemed to be a pre-existing language that they picked up on. Um, and the Aztecs, uh, well, wow, what a nasty bunch of fellows. <laughs> uh, you gotta love the Aztecs. Uh, but Nahuatl is of a family of languages that was spoken, in fact, by the way, still spoken uh, in some of its dialects and versions, but much less than mine. Um, from the Pates of uh, Oregon, so central southern Oregon, all the way down to southern Mexico. So it was a very widespread language family, um, all along the coast primarily. And the, the Mayan, again, the dates here sort of come after the, 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 the um, Aztecs come after the Mayan. So about 1200, so this is fairly late, 1200 the Aztecs arrive in the Valley of Mexico. Um, and they're sort of hunter-gatherers. Their history is pretty clear that they were these aggressive hunter-gatherers. They called them the snake eaters um, because most of, of these people would not eat snakes. They were, they, were, they were sacred or they were feared. The Aztecs were perfectly happy to eat snakes, um, and so they called them snake eaters. And immediately what they did is pissed everybody off. The Aztecs were just really vicious. There are some famous stories, one of them, if you know anything about the history, you probably know, where they, they were trying to make peace, in theory, with this local king. And they, because they're, they're, notice they're interlopers. They have no land, they have no kingdom, they have no history in the area. They're newly arrived. So what do you do? You try to make friends. So they said, well, we want to marry your daughter, a princess, and so then things will be good. Okay, great. All right, so the king says that, and we can make a tribe, we'll make a union, and Apparently their god told them, ah, that's no good. So what you want to do is skin the daughter, dress the priest up in the skin of the daughter, and then invite the king to dinner. <laughs> so they go, okay, let's do that. We'll do that. Uh, and uh, so the king was not impressed by this. He was rather horrified when he discovered that who he thought was his daughter was in fact uh, 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 the priest dressed in the skin of his daughter and he tried to exterminate them, which really isn't a surprise, right? It seems a perfectly reasonable response. Um, and so they sort of fought a whole series of these wars that kept them very marginalized um, uh, until they get to, the, to Lake Tenochtitlan. Uh, again, blowing these names. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, the Lake uh, Tuscoco, uh, which is the big lake in the mid middle of the Valley of Mexico. Not very big today, by the way. It was, used to be very much bigger. Uh, and they built their capital city there, Tenochtitlan, I think, how you pronounce that. Um, and this began their resurgence. And slowly, over the series of about, oh, 200 years, they conquer or make alliances with almost all of their neighbors. Uh, and I say almost all their neighbors because apparently they left one or two of them unconquered so that they could have these formal wars with them because they needed to capture people to sacrifice to their gods. So they were people farming, right? So they would just go out and sort of fight with them. They weren't really trying to win. They're just trying to capture. They called them butterfly wars. Um, and they would just, so they could get capture people and then they would torture them to death publicly uh, and then sacrifice them to their gods. Really friendly people, the Aztecs. However, they were brilliant, brilliant uh, engineers. The, the, the uh, aqueducts, dikes, everything they had to do to build a city in the middle of a lake was spectacular. N nothing like it in the ancient Mesoamerica, certainly pretty much nothing like it, in, maybe not even the Roman Empire. Maybe the, the Great Canal and River Works in China approach what these guys were doing, but it was truly a spectacularly sophisticated engineering system, dams and dikes, and uh, to, to create, again, a city, a large city, by the way, in the middle of the lake. This is, you know, rare, if, if not unique, in history. Um, but they weren't making a lot of friends in the way, as you can imagine. I mean, it sounds brutal to us. It was brutal to the people then, right? I mean, so the Aztecs were considered by the neighboring tribes to be really nasty people. They're like, those Aztecs are bad news. 
So they increase in cultural dominance until about you know, 1571, which is sort of the fateful day, the arrival of Cortes and his merry band of conquistadors. Um, generally, this story is told that, oh, you know, Cortes and 1,000 conquistadors or 1,200 or 800, I'll pick your number, and a few horses terrified the natives and conquered. This is a complete lie. Uh, they did not terrify, they did terrify the natives at times, but they did not conquer in that way. What happened is Cortes and his guys showed up and negotiated with all the people that hated the Aztecs, which turns out to be everybody. Uh, and so a very bloody and long war was fought, relatively long. It took about four years to complete the conquest. This was not a sudden collapse of the Aztec Empire. Uh, this was a long, drawn-out, bloody siege. That, and, and the Aztecs never surrendered. They were basically finally slaughtered in their capital city in the middle of the lake after about a year and a half of steady warfare. Uh, tens of thousands, if not, some scholars estimate as many as 100,000 auxiliary troops with the Spanish may have died fighting the Aztecs. The fact that, the, and, and, and the conquistadors and Cortes had suffered a series of very notable setbacks. They were defeated on several occasions. Um, and this lets, one thing that lets us know is that the Aztecs were sufficiently unpopular that even when the Cortes was defeated and had to flee, wherever he fled, they said, no, 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 you're okay, we're gonna still be your friends, we're gonna ally with you, we're gonna try again. Because this is our chance to get the Aztecs done with, right? This is our opportunity. Because you've got the horses, you've got the guns, you've got the men, and with you on our side, we think we can pull this off. And so over a, a series of years, there was a whole bunch of agreements and peace treaties and organizations that were brought together by the Spanish, working with the local kings to, to get rid of the Aztecs. That's how unpopular they were with their neighbors. Um, but I still, I, in my mind, I have to imagine the day when Cortes comes over the rise because he had heard there was this big kingdom that had a lot of gold. Of course, this is the key, lots of gold, lots of silver. And everybody said big, large, lots of them bad people. And Cortez is like, right, we've dealt with this, we're to the new world. And they come over the Valley of Mexico and they look down into the lake and they see a city that is as large or larger than any city in Europe. Far larger than any city that Cortez or his men had ever seen. Probably a populous population about the same as Paris, possibly greater than Paris, which was at the time the largest city in Europe. Um, there may be one or two cities in China that might have had greater population, but it was certainly the third or fourth largest city in the world, if not second. They had never seen a city that was even a quarter that size, because almost nobody with Cortes is likely to have ever been to Paris. And on a lake built out of lots of stone, lots of causeways, I just, they must have just been blown away. They must have gone, oh my gosh, no wonder you haven't defeated these guys. No wonder you want us to come and fight them, right? It's all becoming clear to me. But also it was clear as they were stupendously, fabulously, incredibly rich. They had gold, and then they had some gold, and they had some more gold. Because they had been mining it and extorting it and bringing it in for years. Again, another reason they weren't that popular with their neighbors. Um, and so this was not the story of a sudden collapse. This was a story of a long drawn out war, primarily brought about the downfall because of the Aztecs' lack of good relations with their neighbors. Um, this, this was carried out in other places, this really helped. But when the um, Spanish finally do conquer the Aztecs, now there's a power vacuum. And that power vacuum is where they really established, well Cortes established his foothold. Because now the Aztecs are gone, well, who gets to be in charge? Everybody sort of said, well, let's, let's let the Spanish do it, right? And that seemed to be, it's just interesting because if you've got 10 or 15,000 troops and there's 1,000 Spanish, you've been fighting with them, you're not afraid of them anymore. You know what they can do. You've seen them get killed. You, you know what horses are, you've seen horse charges, all that terror, all the, oh, we're the ignorant native stuff, forget that. No, they were experienced. They knew what was going on. And either from fear, of, when it's not clear why, either from fear of other people gaining an advantage or 
um, from a, a, a sense that maybe they wouldn't be able to defeat the Spanish themselves, it's not clear which, but there seemed to be a consensus to say, you know, we're just going to keep working in league with the Spanish. And so the Spanish were able to dominate in the very great tradition of old empires, not by putting 10 or 15 or 100,000 Spanish in place and pointing a gun at everybody, but by having a few hundred Spanish in place and having everybody agree that, yeah, we like them, <coughs> that's fine, that works for us. Uh, and so they learned Nuajal, the Spanish being they. Now, Nuajal never had a fully developed written language. They had symbols that they would use regularly, but they didn't have a lot of them. Um, and they had this idea of reading, but what they really meant is they would have a symbol like, say, maybe uh, for fire, say, and tree, and then crop, and then a person. And they would read that and say, oh, what we want to do is we want to uh, set the fire to the tree so we can create land and we can, we can uh, plant in it, and then we'll have food to feed the people. Right? So it was, it, at best, it was a collection of allegorical symbols. If you didn't already know what they meant, you couldn't read them. Um, but it is quite beautiful. I, I couldn't reproduce any colors things. So without the color, it doesn't really work as well. But they are quite beautiful. One thing that Aztecs did give us, which is spectacular, is the Florentine Codex. And I did show you that. Um, a surviving uh, royal scribe, apparently, dictated to, uh, again, a Spanish monk practically everything he knew. It's about 2,400 pages long and includes, I think, 1,100 illustrations. I forget, a lot of illustrations in color. Again, I couldn't get the color to come out well. That's actually a color picture of history, agriculture, engineering, uh, mythology, Kings, lineages, uh, astrology, astronomy, fortune telling, medicine. I mean, it is the it's the gold mine. It is the it's like the it's the object that's the book we wish we had from every single people we've ever encountered. Um, and they, uh, there's a lot of other writing, but but if you want to just look at one, I mean, the Florentine Codex is unbelievable. Why the name Florentine? Because uh, that, that's where it is. It's in Florence. Uh, I believe that's right. Yeah, it's in Florence. I think so, hence Florentine Codex. Usually they're named for where they are. So uh, I don't remember why it's in Florence. Right, why is one of the only surviving pieces of written um, Mayan in Dresden? You know, because that's what we do. We take it and we transport it where we are, right? In, in Dresden, because Germany was not big in the New World, right? So how they ended up with it, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, so it's Florentine Codex. This thing is immense. Um, but it's written in Spanish and a phonetic equivalent of Nahuatl. So it's a dual text, dual language. So it's, it's, it's the, I don't know, it's, it's the, the magic stone, it's the Rosetta stone that you want, plus the history and the narratives. And so at the end of these conquests, what we end up with uh, from the Spanish is, on one hand, a destruction of a lot. There is absolutely no way of glossing over that. I wish we could say, oh, everything was saved. It's not true. But much was saved. In fact, a remarkable amount was saved. And what's uh, sort of shocking to me, the more research I've done on this uh, over the years, is how little of that seems to be translated into the popular mind. And, and that's sort of where I want to end up, is this, is this concept of why do we know so little? I mean, everybody, we all studied Egypt when we were in school, right? Everybody studied Egypt and we know the Nile and it floods and there was some queens and a pharaoh and, you know, this sort of thing, right? And, and that seems very important to us. And the Mayans somehow seem very far away, <laughs> which is odd because geographically, of course, the Mayan are right there. The Aztecs are really right there, both historically and geographically. I mean, the, Az the, uh, the Aztecs are only 500 years ago. 600 years ago, they had a booming, vibrant, incredibly technologically advanced, unbelievably vicious civilization. It was a big going concern. And yet somehow we've lost that. We remember that they did human sacrifice. We don't know that they had some of the most sophisticated engineering, particularly hydrological engineering the world has ever seen, if not the most sophisticated at that time. They may have been the most advanced hydrological engineers the world had ever seen. You know, we know that they were sort of agrarian, but 
it's, we lose the fact that their agriculture was unbelievably sophisticated because most of Central and South America is not flat, right? We think agriculture, we think big flat field. That's an anomalous environment in Central and South America. Most of it is very hilly, very rocky, often incredibly arid. So how do you do agriculture in that environment? Oh, this is very tricky, right? This is a whole different. So they developed unbelievably great uh, step systems. Um, but remember, it, it, you've got, people have probably seen the pictures of the mountains, right, where you have all the steps cut into them, very deep, going up you know, thousands of feet. How do you get water up there? How do you get crops down? Right? Unless your very peak of your hill happens to have a spring just gushing water, wow, that's lucky. Uh, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't. You have to have really tricky mechanisms to transport water up thousands of feet. You have to have rain catchment systems. You have to have rain storage systems. You have to prevent this, the soil from running off. Because right? it's nice to build a step, but if every time it rains, your topsoil runs off, up your agriculture doesn't work worth a damn. And so uh, you have, on one hand, vibrant, technologically advanced agricultural civilizations that match, in every way, the skills of the, of, of the Egyptians, the ancient Mesopotamians. And with the Mayans, less so with, with the Aztecs and the Wattel, but with the Mayans, you have a fully developed, literate culture with histories, date. The great thing with the, with the Mayans, in fact, almost all these cultures, they were date-obsessed. And so once we worked out their calendars, we know exactly when everything happened. There's almost no estimating once you get to their calendars. Like, oh, well, this happened on Wednesday at 4 o'clock, because it says so right there. And they're very accurate. So we know exactly when things happen. We know when cities were built. We're pretty clear when they were abandoned from the archaeological record. And so there's this whole incredible world of literary, cultural, historical riches that as far as I can tell, we just remain completely ignorant of as a culture, maybe not individually, but as a culture. Uh, and I'm not sure why that is. I just, I can never quite decide why we decided not to pay attention to this incredible thing. Uh, and, and the last note, unfortunately, we do not have that much literature. We have a lot that's been coming into Spanish because of the scholars and the translation. We have all the glyphs, but most of the glyphs, as you can imagine, you know, you don't, carve remembrance of things past into stone, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's going to be like, yeah, Proust is not going to work in stone because uh, it's going to take a long time to write. Uh, so most of the glyphs are, are heroic as they tend to be where you get, you know, king fought a battle, started a city, son was born, dynastic marriage, big victory, horrible crop failure, right? This is sort of the, what they wrote down. But what they have left, and I really recommend, and if you go, go look at this online, because of the magic of, of Google and such, um, the art, the carvings, um, some of the most realistic and beautiful portrayals of the human figure are done by these cultures. They, they, they're, they're not Greek in their approach to the human. They're much more human than that. They, they look like some of these carvings and clay figures look like you could just reach out and shake their hand. They look very individualistic. They're not idealized very often. They, they tend to be, like kings are shown with big pot bellies and scars and sort of a droopy eye, right? And, and, and you know, the, the slaves are shown with mud up to their knees and they sort of look bent over. And families are shown sitting on sort of, sort of couches, I imagine they're benches, they look like couches, you know, on benches sort of with their arms around each other, just like you would take a family photo, but done in these clay figure sets from 1,300 years ago. And they're, but I mean, it looks like a family set up for a photograph, and they'll have little bowls and dishes. They did these little collections of clay figures, and they're absolutely remarkable because they're so human. You know, if you look at the glyphs and, and the writing, you go, oh, it's a weird culture. If you look at their carvings and their art, you go, no, they're just like us. In fact, in some ways, you think they're just like Central and South America today. I mean, it has that same kind of feel to it, that, that you can see the coherence of the culture. And this is what, again, why I think I want to do this from a language standpoint, is if you just said, oh, these people speak Spanish, ipso facto their culture is Spanish, you would, you would lose underlying cultural coherence. 
They don't speak Spanish. Millions and millions of them speak Mayan languages as well as Spanish. Or Nahuatl derived or related languages. And with that has come a culture that is coherent, again, over several thousand years. And if you've been to Mexico or you've been to Central America or you've been to South America, it's different from here. <coughs> it's a different way of life. Everybody comments on this. It's just, it has this whole different feel. If you go and look at the carved figurines or the, or the clay figurines from, again, 1,300 years ago, it looks, you feel it. You can feel it across the years. It's like, oh, there it is. I think these people would have been very similar to the people I'm with now, today, in Costa Rica or, or Ecuador or Guatemala. <coughs> and you can see it if you look at the, at the beautiful work they did in gold. Unfortunately, much of it was melted down by the Spanish. Thank you. Uh, but, but what has survived, the beautifully delicate jewelry, rings, earrings, um, just the, the level of craftsmanship, and, and unfortunately, of course, it's the small stuff that was easier to hide or easier to get lost that had survived often. Not a lot of big, big work left, but apparently they did work quite large. But truly, remarkably beautiful carvings left. Um, and so, yeah, sort of trying to cram in two vast civilizations here um, very quickly, but I think this is why approaching things linguistically is so important, is because these cultures are not gone. The languages are not gone. The writing of mine, obviously, strangely, is coming back. I mean, b truly, bizarrely, right? Why you know, I would never have predicted this. I don't think anybody else did either. Um, but by studying the languages and studying this cultural development, you can see that there's a living heritage there. Uh, the Spanish came in, destroyed a lot, dominated a lot, changed a lot. They didn't change everything. There's a lot that's still there. There's a lot that is still surviving. And reading the literature helps. Look at the art. Really take a look at the, particularly the clay figurines. For me, I find them incredibly moving because they just seem so human, so touchable, so palpable. And they often seem so pleased with themselves. <laughs> they seem like very happy, very well-pleased people. Not arrogant, just relaxed, happy, sort of abundant. Things are good. Life's good. Cura vida, right? That's this idea of, of, of the joy of life. Um, and so in both the, the Mayan and Nahuatl civilizations, we have these cultural heritages that are close to us geographically, um, but they seem to be intellectually thousands of miles away. I'm not sure why that is, but I think I would, I would close with a, with, a, with a suggestion that we work on closing that. Take a look, read some of the material, look at the art, I think you'll be inspired. So Mayan and Nahuatl, thank you very much. And again, I apologize for butchering the name. Yes? There is a book called City of Sacrifice written by a professor of 